Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. Happy, happy new year to everybody, and I just want to thank so many of you for your incredible support, your encouragement, your kind words. They've really uplifted me during this very difficult time, but I'm very glad that I'm back on my feet again, and hopefully I'm going to be able to let out some lovely stories for you to listen to during the week because I want to get back on my feet because I need to put that all behind me now and I'm determined to do so. As you know, I went through a gruesome ordeal. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Um, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night. Well, it was probably, I'm not quite sure, it was probably early hours on, of, on a Saturday morning and three men, dark men with brown eyes, and covered in masks, were standing over my bed. I have no idea what ethnicity they were, but I do know that I have never felt so frightened in my entire life. And actually it felt so surreal. I truly thought I was dreaming because it just, this couldn't be happening to me. And they'd obviously got through a little French window in my house and they assumed I was this wealthy jeweller because there is a jeweller who lives very close to me and who happens to bring their jewels back to their home all the time and they obviously got their wires crossed but still they took everything they could from my house and tied me up so tightly, my hands and my feet and we were just absolutely terrified. Um, one of the men was so dangerous. He was waving a machete around and he had a revolver and he was threatening and, oh my word, um, it was terrifying. I just couldn't wait for these people to leave. Finally, when they did leave, um, it was a battle getting out of these ties, but luckily we were able to scream for help and somebody came to help us and, oh my word, it was awful. And it's very hard to get over something like that because they threatened to kill us. They threatened to chop our heads off. Um, I've never known violence like that before, but it happens. We live in a very dangerous world where there are people out there that really have the potential to do great evil. And those three men were like that. But I'm very glad to tell you two of them were arrested by the police um, on another attempted armed robbery. So thank goodness they were caught. I don't know if the third man is still running free. I have no idea. The police have not kept me updated. But anyway, it always comes back to bite you when you do something evil like that. You can't get away with it indefinitely. But anyway, I'm determined to get back on my feet. And as I say, be patient with me. But I'm hoping I've got lots of stories that are already written, they just need to be read to you, and tonight is no exception to that. But I just want to say thank you so much. I love you guys so much. You mean the world to me. Your support has been incredible, and thank you so much for that. I really can't thank you enough. So let's get started with tonight's story, shall we? And once again, happy, happy new year. Dear Sarah, and all your lovely listeners. Mrs. Pearl Atchison was my beloved grandmother. She was originally born in Scotland, but came over to America when she was about six years old, as her stepfather was an American who had fallen in love with a Scottish girl and brought her back to America with him as his wife, much to the delight of his parents, who wondered if their single son would ever make an honest woman of some lucky young lady. So when Ella arrived from Scotland with her two children, little Finn and her sister Pearl, like a serendipitous gift from the gods, his parents were over the moon, not only to have a daughter-in-law, but two grandchildren as well, although the two children were born from a different father, who had sadly died soon after Pearl was born. Sometimes if you listen to her very carefully, you might pick up an unusual twang in her accent that would leave an indelible hint in her words. A slight roll of the tongue, perhaps, that you could say was like a musky note in a perfume that showed my grandmother was not just a southern belle, but she was peppered with something a tad different that made her a little eccentric, you could say. When Pearl was a little girl, 
Her parents moved into a charming old farmhouse that was as pretty as a picture and quaint and quirky as some of the cottages you might find in the Highlands and Scotland. They moved to a small town in South Carolina with her brother Finn, who was a year older than she was. My grandmother disappeared one day when she was about seven years old. She told me that that was the scariest day of her mother's life. I have no idea what actually happened to me, she told me, as I have no memory of that day. Because you don't really remember much when you're that young, do you? My mother described me as quite a handful when I was a child. I was so easily distracted, you see, always disappearing. She could count on her hands over a dozen times, even when she was at the grocer's or baker's, when I would clandestinely just vanish into thin air and be as elusive as the Scarlet Pimpernel. Well, that's what she'd say anyway. In truth, no one knew where on earth I'd get to. The good news is I'd eventually be found. But it was normally a stray cat, a dog or pigeon that would lead me astray. Because when I approached them, they would naturally run away and I would just chase after them. The sheriff organised a search party in our small town where dozens of people volunteered to look for my grandmother. They called out Pearl's name, until they were hoarse and their throats were dry and parched. They scanned the entire countryside with a fine tooth comb, leaving no stone unturned, and unfortunately they could not find little Pearl anywhere. Suffice to say Ella, her mother, was faced with the grim, unenviable prospect of facing the gruesome reality that her daughter Pearl may well have been abducted, but there was no record of crime in the town. So why had a child just suddenly mysteriously gone missing without a trace? The incident caused a grievous upset in the local community, as families were worrying if it was actually safe for their children to play out of doors, as people wondered whether there was a predator in their midst of the human kind that may be living among them like a wolf in sheep's clothing, which was a dispiriting thought if ever there was one. Dr Isaac Fleming was called to give Ella a sedative, as she was inconsolable with grief, crying out, Where is my baby? Where is my baby? Please someone help me find my baby! The woman was filled with such a grievous despair, no one could calm her down. Don't you worry, Mrs Brackenbridge, we will find your little girl for you, the town sheriff informed her. I am sure nothing untowards has happened to her. You say your little girl has a habit of disappearing. Pearl's mother Ella had nodded, tears trickling down her face like limp raindrops. Yes, Sheriff, but not like this, never like this, and she's never been gone this long. Well, Mrs Brackenbridge, can you tell me exactly what happened? There is nothing to tell, Sheriff, Ella had said. I was watching over my daughter Pearl and my son Finn from the front porch. I was knitting a sweater, Sheriff, and I glanced down at my knitting for a fleeting moment. That's all it took. I looked up and my Pearl was gone. My son Finn never saw where she went. He's not very observant. He was playing with his water pistol. I searched for little Pearl everywhere, Sheriff, absolutely everywhere. She was nowhere to be found. I don't understand what could have happened to her. It makes no sense to me at all. How can anyone just vanish into thin air with in the blink of an eye like that? Well, you know, little girls, Mrs Brackenbridge, they can be notorious for making mischief. And I am sure your little girl is no exception to that rule. She probably wandered off somewhere. Are there any ponds on your property that I should be wary about? No, nothing like that around here. Well, that's a very good promising start, isn't it? I'm sure we will find your little girl, said the sheriff, probably with more conviction than he actually felt. He had to do his best to appease the distraught woman, but he wanted this matter resolved as quickly as possible before the press learnt about it. He was proud of the record of the small town, its blemish-free reputation which meant it was safe to go to bed at night with doors and windows unlocked. The disappearance of Little Pearl could change everything, and he certainly didn't want that to happen.
It was the middle of summer. The weather had been searingly hot, showing no mercy to any of the locals. Many people complained bitterly that there was an insufferable heat wave. The nights were warm, so even if Pearl was out in the elements, she would certainly not freeze to death. But it was the wild animals her mother was very concerned about. A seven-year-old girl might make a lovely, delicious meal for a hungry coyote, who would see such an innocent child as easy pickings. The woodgrave on Ella's property was thoroughly searched, but there was not a trace of Pearl to be found anywhere. When finally the sun set over the horizon, and the dark, gloomy, inauspicious evening rolled forwards like a stage curtain at the theatre, the townsfolk felt completely defeated, overly exhausted, extremely wary, from a fruitless, tiresome search that had left them completely confounded. They were befuddled as to the enigmatic whereabouts of Little Pearl. It felt for Ella's mother as if her whole life had been demolished by a wrecking ball. She retired to bed that night with a heavy, burdened heart, fearing that she'd never ever see her daughter again. It must have been about twelve o'clock at night that there was a loud banging on the side of the house. As if someone was relentlessly hitting the walls with a large baseball bat. She could hear a strange hooting sound, as if there was an owl somewhere trapped inside her house, desperately trying to escape. Ella had been through a fitful, unpleasant night's sleep. Despite the sedation she'd been given by the doctor, she hurried quickly downstairs to see what on earth was going on. The owl hooting stopped very suddenly. Maybe someone in town had at long last found her daughter. She hardly dared to hold her breath, with her husband following close behind her. What the hell is that noise? Who's thumping our house at this god-awful time of the night, he said. I wish to God if people wanted to get our attention, they'd have the common decency to use the doorbell, or knock on our wrought iron knocker. Not bang our house within an inch of its life. Ella did not answer her husband. There was a big knotty lump in the back of her throat, made so much worse by her earnest trepidation. She hung between the pendulum of hope and despair. Please, God, she prayed silently to herself. May the person banging the house have some good news for us. I mean, rapping with such an urgency had to be good news, surely, she thought. She didn't allow herself to think otherwise. If her mind wandered off in the wrong direction, like a wavering balloon on the wind, who knew what sombre thought she might choose to entertain? She had been having hauntingly graphic nightmares of wild animals attacking her daughter, or worse still, an evil man, keeping her locked up in a dusty cellar, surrounded by silken cobwebs and large, vicious-looking spiders, so that her poor little precious girl was terrified out of her wits. Ella trembled as her hand slid on the door handle and reluctantly opened the front door. At first she was greeted by the tenebrific atmosphere of a velvety black night that cloaked everything in an ambiguous foggy veil. There was only a soft trajectory of moonlight that tenaciously pushed itself through the dark sky, washing its subtle illumination over the front yard. And that was when she saw her daughter standing there, looking a little fatigued, but no worse for wear. Although her cotton dress was frayed at the edges, covered with dirt patches, and her face looked as if she'd been wearing a mud mask. My grandmother had no memory of that event, but she told me that her mother rushed forwards, grabbing her in her arms, giving her the biggest, warmest embrace. P Pearl! Oh my God! Pearl, it's you! said Ella, hugging her daughter so tightly that she almost blocked her daughter's airways in her enthusiasm. I've been worried out of my wits! Everybody's been looking for you! But why? she asked her mother. I was fine. The fur lady looked after me. Ella noticed that little Pearl had grazes and scratches on her knees that had been covered by a very sheer plaster that looked like it had been made from woven grass. How extraordinary, she thought. When Ella finally did manage to squeeze some information out of her daughter, little Pearl was nonchalant and rather perplexed, possibly a tad overwhelmed by her mother's incongruous ebullience. Why did you disappear? she asked her daughter. Mummy, I saw a white doggy in the woods. It was a nice big white doggy. 
I wanted to catch the white dog so I could keep him as a pet, but he ran away from me. Ella sighed. She knew what that meant. She should have guessed all along. Her daughter had seen a white dog or whatever it actually was and had done what she always did incredibly well and given it chase. It didn't matter that Ella had told Pearl a dozen times over never to wander off. When the girl saw an animal of interest, it seemed that all her faithfully honourable promises to be a good little girl went flying out of the window. It was hard to gleam anything from Pearl, who was never a talkative child at the very best of times. But Ella learnt from her daughter that the very nice fur lady had picked her daughter up and taken her to a cave and had put green stuff all over her knees to make them feel better, followed by woven plasters that were stuck to her daughter's knees with a gum-like resin with antibiotic antibacterial qualities. The fair lady was really nice, Mamma. She helped my knee get so much better. I tripped and fell over, you see. I hurt myself after I went to find the white dog, but it was gone in the woods. I couldn't see it any more. The fur lady told me I must not go near the white dog because it might bite me really badly. She said she'd take care of me and she'd bring me right back home when I got better. But my knee hurt so much, so I stayed with her and played until it got better. Now you listen to me, Pearl, and you listen hard. I don't care if your knee was hurting. That is no excuse. You should have come home at once. Mummy and Daddy were very worried about you. My grandmother was bemused. She looked at her scolding mother with a nonplus bewildered expression on her face that made her look a little older than her seven years of age. But why would you worry about me? I told you I was fine. Because, sweetheart, said my mother, grabbing her head of curly blonde ringlets and looking directly into her blue eyes. We did not know where you were, did we? How were we to know you were fine, Pearl? Something terrible could have happened to you. You must promise me never ever to do that again. Do you understand what I'm saying? Pearl nodded, but Ella knew in her heart that her little daughter had an unquenchable appetite for adventure, especially when an animal was involved and it was likely her wise words had fallen on deaf ears, as Pearl had very selective hearing when she chose. Ella marvelled at the masterful-looking plasters that meticulously were made of woven grass, attached to her daughter's skin. Whoever had cleaned her daughter up knew a thing or two about first aid, she thought. Ella was exceedingly perturbed. Someone had helped her daughter, but she never knew who the fur lady was and her daughter describing her in such an idiosyncratic way left her with more questions than answers. Surely no one would be wearing fur in this god-awful heat wave, she thought. Everybody had been complaining about it bitterly. Even the bleached grass had lost its green lustre, as if it had been baked by the cruel sun. And many of the plants looked withered, and as if they were dying, as they had fried in their vases. Everyone in town was mystified that Pearl had reappeared out of nowhere, like a perennial flower that suddenly emerges after a cruel, hard, somewhat bleak winter. It would seem that while little Pearl was having a fabulous time with the fur lady, everyone in town had been fraught with worry as they searched frantically for her, but all were heartily relieved that she had been found safe and well, as the silly little minx had just run off. And thankfully the press never got wind of the story for the sheriff successfully kept the matter under cloak and dagger. He wanted the crime-free reputation of his town to remain firmly intact. See, I told you, the sheriff told my mother. Your daughter wandered off in pursuit of an animal. I think if you bought her a little puppy dog, she might quit disappearing like she does. It seems she has a penchant for following animals around, and that's why she gets hopelessly lost. It's like she gets tunnel vision, doesn't she? Loses all sense of her bearings. If you ask me, maybe if she had her own dog to look after, she wouldn't get quite so distracted. She clearly loves animals a great deal. You know what, Sheriff? You're not just a handsome face, said Ella. That's not half such a bad idea. Ella brought my grandmother a puppy dog. She was delighted with the little white Scottish terrier that she called Mocha. Where on 
earth did you get that strange name from? Her mother asked her. What does it even mean? The fair lady, she told me her name is Mocha, Pearl said proudly. It means the one who dances with the earth. Do you think that if I call my dog Mocha, she'll also dance? We'll see about that, said Ella unable to suppress her secret amusement at the idea of owning a Scottish terrier who could dance. She could imagine her daughter dressing it up in a tutu like a ballerina. She couldn't put anything past Pearl. Obstensively as a little girl, Pearl would spend hours playing with Mocha, as well as studying her mother's wedding pictures. She thought getting married was like being Cinderella for a day, and Pearl fancied herself as a princess. She was in awe of her mother's beautiful white dress and was forever dressing up in her mother's high-heeled shoes, trying on all her clothes and plastering makeup on her face that was so badly applied she looked like a contemporary piece of artwork gone badly wrong with so many unfortunate smudges. Pearl met her husband-to-be when she was eight years old, as he would turn out to be quite coincidentally the boy next door that she and her brother Finn would play with regularly. One day Pearl had been given a whole bag of marbles. These marbles were incredibly stunning. They had been given to her from her godmother, who had sent them from Scotland, claiming she would bought them on a recent trip to London, where she would purchased them from the famous toy store there, Hamleys. The marbles were in such high demand, they were literally walking off the shelves, and the shop had to keep reordering them. Pearl had never seen such magnificent marbles in all her life. She knew that she had the power to influence her brother and Simon, the next-door neighbour's boy, to do exactly as she wanted with these marbles. They were great for bartering with. As she had predicted, her brother and her friend Simon wanted one of those unique marbles for themselves. "'I'll only give you a marble or two if you play weddings with me,' she told them. "'I want to be a beautiful bride, dressed in a white dress, marching down the aisle.' You can be the priest, she told her brother Finn, and I'll marry Simon over here. The two boys pooh-poohed the idea of playing such a pathetic girly game. Do I really have to marry you? said Simon, pulling a face. What if I don't want to? If you don't do what I say, said Pearl, then you won't get one of my amazing marbles, and that would be a dreadful shame, would it not? she said, waving the marbles in front of them like a chicken wing over a drooling crocodile. All right, we'll do it, said Simon begrudgingly. But you can't tell any of the boys at school about this, or they'll tease me and poke fun at me. I won't tell anyone, she assured them. It'll be our secret. Pearl got dressed in a pretty white dress, picked some wild flowers from the alpine meadow to use as a bouquet. She marched down the cobbled pathway in their backyard, which she had covered with red towels, while her brother Finn conducted the ceremony under the rose-coloured pergolia. Simon, do you take Pearl to be your wife? he asked the young boy earnestly, as he read from the Bible. Simon wrinkled up his nose in disgust at the very idea, and said very reluctantly, in a quiet voice, I do. The boys were very pleased with their marbles. Simon thought marrying Pearl for a few sparkling marbles at the time seemed to be a small price to pay, as the marbles they got from Pearl were the envy of all the boys at school. When Pearl was about eleven years old, Simon's family sadly moved away from the town, and Pearl and Finn missed him greatly. One day my grandmother serendipitously bumped into Simon, as his family had come to town to attend a funeral. My grandmother was eighteen years old at the time, and thought that Simon had turned into an incredibly handsome young man, who made her heart flutter ever so slightly. She said there were sparks flying between the two of them, like moths to a light. It really surprised her, because although she had liked Simon growing up, there were times she thought he was a silly little boy, and likewise he probably thought the same about her. Simon was gobsmacked by Pearl when he saw her for the first time, the opinionated little girl who had insisted on playing dress-up all the time and was obsessed with her dog called Mocha. He knew that this was the woman he wanted to marry. He couldn't believe this little dreamer who had annoyed him a great deal with her whimsical fancies had managed to transform herself into a beautiful woman like a caterpillar metamorphosizing into a butterfly. Simon went straight up to Pearl 
and asked her for a date. What makes you think I'll say yes? My grandmother had teased him. You mean you don't remember? In case you've forgotten, Pearl, we're actually both married. You were the one that insisted we got married when we were eight years old. So I think as your husband, you owe me a date, don't you? My grandmother hooted with laughter and said, Well, if you put it like that, how can I possibly refuse you? After that, the couple were inseparable, professing to be madly in love. The irony of ironies is that when my grandmother tied the knot with Simon, her own brother Finn married the both of them. He had become a priest. It was almost as if when they were children, they were serendipitously acting out a future event without even realising its startling implications. For one day, the dress rehearsal would actually become the real deal. My grandmother was a petite woman, not in height, but in size. People underestimated how tough she could actually be. How could a small woman be intimidating? But she was. Of course, my mother Amanda knew all about that, for she had grown up with Pearl. She had seen firsthand how her mother never hesitated to put her six-foot-four very well-built husband Simon, firmly in his place if he stepped out of lion. Simon loved the bones of his wife, but always said that you had to handle her with care. Because if you didn't watch out, you could get burnt. My mother knew better as a young girl not to upset her mother, so she rarely did. Pearl was by no means a henpecker, but she was as opinionated as she had been at eight years old. She was inclined to be mulishly stubborn. It was pointless getting into an argument with her, as you were not going to win. Simon had learnt that from Pearl when she was eight. Let's just say my grandmother did not suffer fools gladly, and was never intimidated or daunted by anyone a day in her life. One day when my mother Amanda came home from school in a dreadful state, because a little boy had bullied her in class, he called me a stupid and dumb. He said that because I got the math all wrong. She told her mum. Pearl arrived at my mother's school the following day, walking into my mother's classroom without a buy or leave, not concerning herself with rudely interrupting a lesson. I gather the teacher was so stunned she never said a single word, actually stepping aside for Pearl so the woman could say her piece. Which one of you is Tommy Wiseman? she asked. Everyone quickly pointed at a little boy with a mop of curly brown hair and brown mischievous eyes to match that suddenly became fearful as Pearl began pointing her fingers accusingly at him. Tommy Wiseman, I am Amanda's mother, Pearl. If you call my daughter stupid again, I will have your guts for garters. Do you understand, Mr. Wiseman? Not so wise any more, are we? You were the one that was stupid to call my Amanda stupid. That's a very stupid thing to do. She raised a fist to the boy. You see this? This is my hand. It might be very small, but it packs a strong punch, I assure you. And I'm not afraid to use it when needs must. And with that, she stormed out of the classroom. And everybody stared after Pearl, with looks of wondrous awe on their faces at the balls of the small woman, including the teacher who continued to teach the class. No one dared ever bully my mother again. Many of the kids had a secret admiration for Pearl, my feisty grandmother, who was not afraid to take the bull by the horns when the right occasion arose. When I was growing up, I remember my grandmother Pearl would wear large diamond rings on her fingers and a variety of expensive brooches and necklaces. I think my grandmother loved jewellery, but her expensive collection of jewels did not go unnoticed in our small town. My grandmother had a keen eye for beautiful things, like she'd done as a young girl, when she studied her mother's wedding photographs and would dress up in her mother's clothes and high heel shoes. So it didn't come as a surprise when she married her husband Simon that she collected a sizable amount of fabulous jewellery that he gave her as gifts. Who knew how expensive a few fancy marbles could turn out to be? He teased her. When I agreed to marry you at eight years old, I had no idea what an expensive woman you would ultimately become. But I will say this, my darling. You're worth every single penny you are. 
and I wouldn't have it any other way. My grandmother loved to dazzle like a peacock showing off its grandiose finery to the rather bedraggled looking grey pea hens. It wasn't that my grandmother was trying to show off to gleam admirers, but she just loved to look a million dollars. It didn't matter whether she went to a barbecue or to an opera. She always looked like she'd stepped out of a bandbox. Some may have said it was over the top and far too ostentatious and frivolous to wear so much extravagant expensive jewellery. But Pearl was larger than life. Her ornate jewellery was an extension of her vivacious, larger-than-life personality. Sadly, my grandfather Simon died when my grandmother was in her late sixties. The coroner said he'd had a massive heart attack. I remember me and my mother went to stay at Pearl's farmhouse in order to comfort her. My grandmother was a stoic woman, and after her husband's death she just closed the door of her bedroom, cried for a couple of days, then wiped away her tears and got on with her life. That was the way she was. She had such a positive outlook on life, but she always kept a picture of her beloved husband on her side table, so he was never ever forgotten. She never removed her wedding band from her finger either. He may not be here physically, she would tell me, but your grandfather has never ever left my side. Luke Bessinger's account. The story I'm going to share with you comes with a great deal of shame. It is not a story I would gladly share with anyone, but more something I'd brush under the carpet, very clandestinely, and hope no one would know about it at all. But if I did that, then the fabric of this story would wear away until there was nothing left, and this is a story that needs to be told, even if it is with a measure of reluctance. So I'm going to nakedly bear myself before you, warts and all, and I'm afraid it's not pretty. So please don't judge me too unkindly. If I have any excuses for my irrational behaviour, I would say I was young, naive, callow, definitely stupid. Growing up in our small town, everyone knew the old lady with the blue hair called Pearl. How could you not know her? She stood out in our community, like a rose among the thorns. She always looked like she was dressed so dramatically for the theatre. I always assumed she was stinking rich for she would wave her hands around like an octopus oscillating its tentacles as she was gregarious in every way, and her graceful pretty fingers were dripping with ornate diamonds that were worth a bob or two, let me tell you. She was like a mobile jewellery store, displaying her wares for all to see. I do not believe she did it to show off. I genuinely think she was like a magpie, and was drawn to sparkling things. She was incredibly feminine in that regard. I do remember it had been a long hot summer, and me and my brother Haywood were trying to save up enough money to buy a horse, by doing all kinds of chores, not only for my parents, but around town for other people. We worked our butts off, soaping down people's cars, painting people's wicker fences white, or windows. We mowed people's lawns, and weeded people's yards. But we just didn't raise enough money to purchase a horse that my father had agreed to pay half the price for. I'm not buying the horse for you outright, my father had insisted. You boys both need to understand the dynamics of industriously working for a living. If I give you a free hands out like a pair of self-entitled brats, you won't appreciate the empowering feeling of being resourceful and financially independent. My mother had wavered. Honestly, Sydney, must you be so tough on our boys? They've worked so hard. Why don't you buy them the horse and cut them some slack? It's hardly as if they've been lazy all summer. Jenny, don't you understand a word of what I'm saying? My father said indignantly. I am teaching our children to become men. How can they possibly do that if I do everything for them? My father refused to buy us a horse outright, even though we had a stable block and two horses, one belonging to my mother, the other to my father. But me and my brother hankered after a horse of our own, and the horse we wanted to buy was called Simbad, who had the most incredible nature. My brother and I wanted to own that horse more than all the tea in China, and Farmer Joe had promised to sell it to us within a month, but time was fast running out, and we stood a very real chance of losing Simbad to some other buyer. The pressure was building up to raise the cash, 
but we were way short of our goal, and were nowhere even close to acquiring enough funds for our father to meet us halfway in buying Simbad. One day we were at Hal's diner in town. It was a place where the locals would happily congregate for a burger and chips, pancakes with maple syrup, or a milkshake, but for the adults, coffee was always in high demand, especially the house special with frothy milk. On this occasion we'd been given a tip over our payment for mowing Mrs Evans' lawn. "'You boys have been working so terribly hard. You must be dreadfully hot today. You go off to Hal's diner on me. Buy yourself some ice cream to cool down, won't you?' "'Thank you, Mrs Evans,' we had said. "'Well, I don't know what I would do without you boys lending me a hand in my yard. When Bert was alive, he would do it. But with my very bad back, I simply haven't got the mobility to mow my own lawn.' "'Glad to be of help, Mrs Evans,' we had said. We had decided to buy a couple of milkshakes. I sat there in the booth at the diner, taking the occasional sip of my milkshake, and then wiggling around the straw in my glass, very thoughtfully. "'I'm so tired,' I said. "'So tired of working so hard. When did we last have any fun?' My brother wrinkled his freckled nose, shrugged his shoulders. "'Sorry, bro. The word fun is alien to me, and is as extinct in my life as a dinosaur, I'm afraid. It doesn't belong in my vocabulary, nor does it belong to yours, as you can appreciate.' "'That's my whole point, bro. Don't you see? It's not fair. Does Dad even give us a break? He works us like a couple of cart horses.' "'Correction, Luke.' He doesn't force us to work, but if we don't work, bang goes the prospects of getting our horse. Do you know how many yard sheds I've been cleaning up recently? How many lawns I've mown? I've had enough, bro. Don't you think we can persuade Mum to get Dad to pay for the entire horse without expecting us to meet him halfway? It's insane. At this rate, we're not going to get anywhere. She's already tried to help us, bro. But it ain't any use. When it comes to our dad, it's the age-old adage, isn't it? You can lead a horse to water. You can't make it drink. Dad's the horse that refuses to drink. Mum has no influence on him when he's like this. Dad is mulishly stubborn. You know that. I know at that. There ain't a darn thing we can do about it. I slammed my green-coloured milkshake onto the counter. I bet! Dad never had to work this hard a day in his life when he was our age. Does he really want us to live our lives constantly overloaded with work? There has to be a way we can make easy money. I feel like a donkey that's been plodding away so hard that I'm only fit for the scrapyard. It was at that precise moment that Mrs. Pearl Atchison came into the diner with her granddaughter Macy. They sat down in the booth opposite us. Me and my brother were sucking up the remnants of our milkshake when Mrs. Atchison glanced over at us. Hello, boys. How are you doing? Fine, Mrs. Atchison. Good, I'm so glad to hear it. What is this that you've been drinking? Mine is a lime milkshake, I told her. My brother's drinking a vanilla. Do you want another one? She asked us. You're welcome to join us both at our booth and meet my lovely granddaughter, Macy she said, giving me a mischievous wink. I knew exactly what was on Pearl's mind. She saw me as a good match for her granddaughter. You couldn't be more transparent if you tried. I was 18 years old, for goodness sake. I had absolutely no interest in a 15-year-old girl, who in my book was still a baby. I preferred girls my own age or older, but I didn't want to be hanging around with Mrs. Atchison's granddaughter. But she had said there was a free milkshake in there for us and I was hardly going to look a gift horse in the mouth, was I? So my brother and I agreed to join them for a drink. Mrs. Atchison's granddaughter was wearing these ugly braces. She gave me a goofy grin. She could have been pretty without those god-awful braces, but in my book, she was barely out of nappies. I'm sorry, that's what I felt at the time. In those days, a two-year age difference between the sexes was monumental. I don't remember what was said although Macy giggled several times like a silly schoolgirl with a pathetic crush. It was clear she fancied me, and made no secret of it. My focus was not on Pearl's granddaughter, but on the extraordinaire diamond rings that Pearl was wearing. 
As she talked away garrulously, those diamonds twinkled and sparkled so brightly, and in a second an idea was born in my mind, like a seed suddenly taking root and pushing its green shoots through the earth and soil. Well, it's been so lovely to see you boys, said Pearl. I'm taking Macy to look for a brand new dress as a treat. So we better love you and leave you, she said, calling the waitress over to settle the bill, and retreating from the diner, arm in arm with her granddaughter. It's been so nice meeting you, Luke, said Macy, giving me that doe-eyed, I like you a lot look, which I blindly ignored. Oh my God, Macy likes you, my brother laughed. Her braces are gross, don't you think? But my bet is when they're removed, she'll be quite pretty, actually. You could do worse, bro, he teased. No, thanks. The kid's only fifteen. I'm two years older than her. She's a teeny bopper. I've just had an idea, bro, I said. I know a way we can raise enough money to buy Simbad. But word of warning, you ain't going to like it. But the way I see it, we're running out of options, as the sand is rushing quickly through the hourglass. So there we are. That's part one to our story. Part two is tomorrow night because it's in two parts and it's another amazing Bigfoot encounter. But before I finish, I just want to say once again, thank you to each and every one of you for your amazing support. And I'm so glad to be back with you now and love to each and every one of you. So much love. Take care. Good night to you all.